according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. My guest today is Stephen Kinzer, an award-winning foreign correspondent and best-selling author. His latest book, Poisoner in Chief, examines the CIA's search for mind control. Stephen, you know, this is an interesting topic, and we're going back in time here, back to the 50s and 60s, when we talk about mind control. And I'm sure many people will roll their eyes, but this isn't a conspiracy. The CIA's MK Ultra project is now part of the public record thanks to a 1975 congressional investigation. When did the program begin and what was its goal? Why did we have this program? In the uh, late 40s and early 50s, when the CIA was in its infancy, uh, leaders of that agency were seized by a terrible fear that uh, the Soviets or the communists had somehow found the key to mind control. This was a, a mistake. This was uh, not correct, of course, but they felt that this was a terrifying threat to the United States. And the only way to stop it was for us also to find the key to mind control. So they went off on this crazy search and the feeling was that it was so important since the prize of success would be something like global mastery, that the deaths of a few people or a few hundred people uh, would mean nothing. And, the and this project wound up sponsoring the most extreme experiments on human beings that have ever been carried out by any agent officer of the US government. And only a piece of it is now known, but that piece is pretty horrific. Now, you refer to the leader of the project as the CIA's poisoner-in-chief. Who was he, and why did you give him that nickname? I think I discovered the most powerful unknown American of the 20th century. That was Sidney Gottlieb, who, until the publication of my book, had never been heard of, really. I, I feel like my bio book is the biography of a person who essentially didn't exist. He, he was so invisible. But when you see what he did, this was a guy who conducted excruciating experiments, including many that were fatal, on victims across Europe, Asia, and inside the United States. He had what amounted to a license to kill issued by the US government. He was allowed to travel to foreign countries and requisition human subjects from the police or CIA or mil American military people and experiment them to death if he wanted to using the most bizarre combinations of extreme drugs, sensory deprivation, electroshock and all kinds of other torments. So Sidney Gottlieb was the chief chemist of the CIA. Later on in the uh, late 50s and early 60s, he's the guy that made the poisons that were supposed to kill Fidel Castro and Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. But before that, he had carried out this brutal and highly secret project, which was considered one of the highest priorities of the CIA in the 1950s. That was MK Ultra, the search for a way to blast away a human mind so a new one could be placed in instead. Now, what kind of human experiments were involved in this? And did they really originate from Nazi camps? Let me answer the second question first about the Nazis. Yes. So one of the most shocking aspects of MK Ultra is this. The CIA at the very beginning and Gottlieb himself as a scientist started out their project asking themselves, what research is already out there? Who knows how to torment people? Who has a lot of data on how to destroy a human mind, how to destroy a human body, how to destroy a human spirit? And the first answer they came up with was the Nazi doctors who had worked in concentration camps, plus their Japanese counterparts who had carried out even more gruesome and fatal experiments. So the CIA wound up hiring doctors who had worked for the Nazis. The Surgeon General of the Nazi army came to work for the CIA. The chief of biological research for the Nazis came to work for the CIA. They were all part of MKUltra. Uh, now, when I was researching this book, 
uh, I visited what I think may be the first CIA secret prison. It's in a beautiful chalet in Germany, not far from Frankfurt. The guy who now owns the building is a young businessman. He's converted it into nice condos. And he took me inside. He took me into the basement. And he told me, this is the place where the CIA experimenters carried out torments that were designed and first used in the Nazi concentration camps just down the road from here. And then he told me the older people who live around here tell me they all knew, they all know what happened here. And they told me the bodies of people who the CIA killed under experimentation and torture were buried in the forests around here in places that are now covered over by shopping malls and apartment blocks. So your second question is absolutely uh, correct that the Nazi experiments, so-called, these gruesome, murderous uh, torments that they imposed in concentration camps formed the basis for the CIA's MK Ultra project. Now, as for your other question, what were these experiments? There were two different kinds, the kinds he conducted in the United States and the kinds he conducted abroad. Within the US, Gottlieb's favorite subjects were prison inmates for obvious reasons. They're under the control of a warden and they have really no choice. So for example, I found one experiment at the federal prison in Lexington, Kentucky, where seven African-American inmates were given triple doses of LSD every day for 77 days without told what, being told what it was. And that was an attempt to find out if that could destroy a human mind. And the answer of course is yes. Now abroad, the experiments were even more intense because there the CIA was able to use what they called expendables. These were people who could be killed and nobody would notice. Suspected enemy agents who had been arrested or refugees who turned up with no visible connections to anyone. And these people would be supplied to Gottlieb and the MK Ultra crew to test whatever bizarre torments they were into that week. Now, let me ask you, why did the CIA believe mind control was possible? This is a great question. And I reflect on this in my book, Poisoner in Chief. I think there are two reasons. The immediate reason was a couple of events that happened uh, in the early Cold War, which the CIA misinterpreted. One was the trial of Cardinal Menzenti in Hungary. This was an anti-communist Catholic prelate. He was arrested by the communist regime, held for some months, put on a show trial and confessed to crimes that he obviously hadn't committed. He spoke in a kind of a monotone. He looked glazed. We now know that he was coerced with just the normal techniques that brutal interrogators have been using since forever. But the CIA didn't believe that. They thought that somehow his mind had been seized and he was speaking words that were fed to him through some kind of special system that we couldn't penetrate. The other episode was in Korea. You remember that when American soldiers came home from Korea, the ones who had been imprisoned by North Korea, the prisoners were finally released. It turned out that thousands of them had signed statements uh, saying they had carried out war crimes in Korea. Some said they had dropped germ bombs on Korea, something the US government firmly denied. A few of them criticized capitalism and American life. And we immediately presumed that that couldn't be something they thought. It must mean that somehow the communists had seized control of their minds. So these were the immediate stimuli for the CIA project. But I asked myself, what opened up their mind to the idea that mind control exists? And I think it goes further back. I think it's cultural. Think of all the movies, all the books, all the stories about mind control. It is a fantastic trope for fiction writers. There's Sherlock Holmes stories. There's Edgar Allan Poe stories. I mean, there's movies like Dr. Caligari and uh, all the way up to the Bourne experiment. So many Stephen, ways that culture Stephen, made let them me jump in here a true. second. Stephen, let me jump in a second. They also created poisons and we're running out of time here. Were any of these poisons used and were they used in an attempt to kill Fidel Castro? Absolutely. Sidney Gottlieb was the man who manufactured poison cigars, poison hypodermic needle, poison fountain pen, poison wetsuit for Fidel Castro. It's only Castro's intelligence service 
that prevented them from being effective. Sidney Gottlieb also personally carried poison across the Atlantic to the Congo to be used to kill the prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, in 1960. So he really was not only the chief chemist, but the chief poison expert. He probably knew more about poisons than anybody in the world. Now, Stephen, the CIA insists the MK Ultra experiments have been abandoned. What's your position on this? Do you think they're still tampering in this, or is it completely the past? Writing this book was a real eye-opener for me. I've written a lot of books, and some of the stuff I found is very surprising, but I think this is the first time I've ever been shocked, even though I've devoted my entire career to trying to figure out what's going on behind the curtain, what's going on that we can't see. Even, even I was shocked by this. So the experience of writing this book has led me to think it would be completely naive to say that there's nothing like this going on now. We don't know about it. It's, I'm sure it's being denied as it was in the 1950s. But with the knowledge I've gained from writing Poisoner in Chief, I'm no longer able to believe that things I previously thought were too bizarre to be real might not actually be happening. Stephen, we're out of time. I want to thank you for sharing the fascinating history with us. And uh, let me finish with this with you. As an American citizen, how do you feel about our government being involved in this type of thing? In a way, I feel like it's just the more extreme expression of something that we do as a country all the time. We are eager to dominate the entire world. And as MK Ultra points out, every single individual in the world. We are simply not able to live as one country among many other countries. So to me, MK Ultra is not something strange that was way off track. In a way, it was just a, a more extreme expression of who we are and what we do. Stephen, thank you very much for sharing this with us. We appreciate it greatly. We'll have you back again at another day, and we'll talk about this some more. Thank you very much.